All right, this is going to be an introductory video, as many people have requested, about the seven ecumenical councils. What do they teach and why are they so important? What's the orthodox position? And we're going to do about two minutes on each one just to give an introduction. And I would remind you, if you would, go ahead and subscribe to my channel below. And for most of these topics, there are lengthy, fuller treatments. So if you want to hear more about each one of these subjects, you can click the links below and find uh, the full two, three hour treatments. In fact, one of the books I'm going to be referencing, the Pelican book, I did a whole analysis of. I think we spent five hours in that text. But So the first the thing that we want to uh, notice is that the church is governed by councils or synods. The church had synods in uh, the early church prior to Nicaea, councils like Ancyra, uh, Gangra, uh, one of those, I think, is right after Nicaea, but those are what we call local synods, and they're patterned on Acts 15, where we see the apostles gather to do the first synod. So it's the normative form of church government, and what we call ecumenical councils are those that are synonymous with the extent of the empire, what would eventually become the Byzantine Empire, or the Oikumene. Now, these are convoked by emperors, uh, and then they have representatives, hopefully, at least in most cases, that they strove to have the church as a corporate body as far as was possible present. The first of these, of course, is the Council of Nicaea, convoked by Constantine, and this is in 325. Now, there's a lot of misunderstandings about Nicaea. It didn't just deal with the deity of Christ. That's, of course, the most important thing that it dealt with. Um, but it also dealt with other things like the date of Easter, uh, questions about ordination, questions about the Eucharist, if you read the canons of Nicaea, uh, and baptism and other subjects. But of course, most famously, St. Athanasius, Alexander, his teacher, and others had defended the centrality of the equality of Christ's divine nature with that of the Father. And so Christ being the direct offspring of the Father's nature, or usia, according to St. Athanasius, uh, he thus po possessed the same essence as the Father, equal in essence, homo usia, even though he's eternally generated by the Father. And that's, of course, what the Nicene Creed and Council lays down, defending and vindicating the theological argumentation of St. Athanasius the Great. And so the locus of the debate, you'll notice, after the First Synod, and then in the next synod, being Constantinople I in 381, it's Trinitarian. Right? It's a relationship between the hypostasis, or person of the Father, and the hypostasis of the Son, and their shared divine nature, with the real distinction between the persons, and then, of course, the deity of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a force, uh, or an impersonal lesser being, or an angel, or anything like that. He's no creature. So after Nicaea, there's continued debates, and you get questions about the person of Christ, right? And as I said, the Holy Spirit. And so the next council uh, in 381 will be convoked by Theodosius, and it will condemn the heresies of Apollinarianism, Sabellianism, and what's called the spirit fighters, or the Pneumatomachi, or the Eunomians, um, different errors about the Trinity once again, and you get what's called Cappadocian vindication, right? This is the Cappadocian theologians, the two Gregories and Basil, who are really, after Athanasius, the most important Trinitarian philosophers and theologians. They really solidify and seal the philosophy and basis and argumentation behind the defense and rationality of the Trinity for Christian theology. And really, this is not even disputed. Um, people might dispute the interpretations of those people, but that they are the most important uh, theologians and um, formulators is not really in question. Now, that's not to the detriment of Western theologians. There were, of course, important Latin theologians like Hilary, Jerome. Uh, but when it comes to the doctrine of Christ and the doctrine of the Trinity, for Orthodox theology and the seven ecumenical councils, it's really the Cappadocians that are the capstone, you could say, uh, on this doctrine. So once you get Nicaea and once you get Constantinople I and the creed solidified there, 
there's really not a whole lot more in the patristic period about the Trinity itself. Now, the locus of the debate will shift to Christology or the person of Christ or debating in what sense he's divine, in what sense he's dual, in what sense he has two natures, in what sense he has two wills and two energies. That's going to be the locus of the debate for the next several centuries, all the way arguably, arguably up until the final uh, of our treatment of the councils, the seventh. And that's not to say there aren't more councils. For the Orthodox, there is an eighth. For Roman Catholics, of course, there's many more. But for the Orthodox, these are the seven that are the most important for the Trinity and Christology. And the seventh synod's uh, uh, discussion and vindication of icons will be also directly related to Christology. So really all seven are Trinitarian and uh, Christological controversies. The next most important council, uh, probably the most debated, you could say, I mean, in one sense, obviously Nicaea is, but uh, the, the Council of Ephesus. Mm -hmm. So Ephesus in 431, it's called by Emperor Theodosius II, and of course the theologian par excellence of that council is St. Cyril. St. Cyril of Alexandria would uh, go to task with Nestorianism. Nestorius was the patriarch of Constantinople, uh, and uh, Cyril, of course, being from Alexandria, he was in the lineage to defend that Athanasian uh, heritage and tradition, and he did so uh, eloquently and brilliantly. And so uh, Nestorianism, Pelagianism are condemned, and you have the victory of the phrase of the Theotokos. Of course, this trips up and confuses a lot of Protestants and evangelicals. They don't understand why you would use this term or why this is so important. But the reason for the term Theotokos is to signify that the person that came forth from Mary, right, in the sense of the hypostasis itself, who he is in terms of his eternal preexistence, is a divine person. It is the hypostasis of the Logos that became incarnate, not the Father, not the Holy Spirit, but one among the Holy Trinity, the second person of the Trinity, the Logos, took on human nature from the Virgin Mary. He took his human nature from her, his body, and he possesses a fully human nature. But we say that that human nature doesn't possess any hypostatic or personal reality of its own. It's only personalized by virtue of the Logos who assumed it, as St. Cyril and later St. John Damascus would say. So at Ephesus, you get the defense of the doctrine that Mariology is perfectly in line and mirrors Christology. So if you get your Christology right, you'll have your Mariology right. If you get your Mariology right, you'll have your Christology right. And this is what Cyril argued. It should also be pointed out that Cyril's key line of argumentation is also the Eucharist. If you read the anathemas of Ephesus, one thing that Cyril argues against Nestorius is that you yourself, Nestorius, in your own liturgy, right, confess to believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And so if Christ is really present there, it can't just be the body of some man. It has to be the body of the God-man, right? And the human nature that he assumed, according to St. Cyril, is deified. So there has to be, and Cyril wrote two letters actually eloquently defending this, called the Two Letters to Successus, where he says that the uncreated power and energy of God deifies and transforms the human nature in Christ. And that deification and transformation can only happen if the glory that Christ transmits to his human nature is uncreated, can't be a creature. And so the energies doctrine there is crucial in Cyril. Cyril in many places defends this doctrine. And we see that there's a direct connection between Christology, Mariology, and the sacraments or sacramentology. And by extension, there will be direct connection to ecclesiology or the doctrine of the church. So, of course, Ephesus very, very important. However, immediately after Ephesus, there's a lot of confusion. As you can uh, begin to see in each one of these councils, it doesn't necessarily solve every issue, and the debate continues. And so from Ephesus, the next two centuries, three centuries, is going to be a debate about the meaning of Ephesus and the next council, Chalcedon. So after that follows the uh, Emperor Marcion calling the council, and you get the um, fam famous uh, Pope St. Leo, Leo the Great, who writes his tome where he discusses the uh, uh, diophysite, the two natures in the incarnate Christ, in the one person or hypostasis. So 
what sense does this mean, right? Does this mean that the hypostasis is composite in some moral sense? Does it mean that Christ's one person is composite in some other sense, and in the sense of a substantial change? Is it still Nestorianism, right? This is a big debate after Chalcedon, and even though St. Cyril in many places discusses the two natures very clearly, even after the Incarnation, it's a hotly debated topic. And that's where we get to the next council, which is the affirmation, and this is very important, of the Cyriline, or St. Cyril from the third council, as we said, Ephesus, the Cyriline interpretation of the fourth council. So the affirmation at Constantinople II, where you get the famous uh, edict and calling of uh, the council by St. Justinian, and the council produces the, the theological edict, I'm saying, uh, which says that we have to interpret Chalcedon in a Kyrillian way. This is the victory of the Neo-Kyrillian interpretation of Chalcedon. And what is that Neo-Kyrillian interpretation? Well, uh, the Fifth Council makes it very clear in its dogmatic pronouncements that it is the one divine hypostasis in two natures. Uh, right? There's not a mixture. Uh, it explains how we interpret composite hypostasis or composite person. And it means it in the sense of a, strictly speaking, one divine person. There's not a substantial change in the Logos himself when he assumed human nature. But he really does become united. There is a real union, a real hypostatic union. And the Sixth Council right, becomes the next phase in this hotly debated topic. Now it becomes a question uh, with, in what sense does Christ possess this duality? And in what sense is this union real? We know from the councils that have occurred already that the union is real. Right? There's not a loose moral union between two subjects, a divine subject of uh, Logos and a human subject, Jesus. That's Nestorianism. There's a single subject the Fifth Council will mandate, and that single subject is only divine. However, that single subject acts in two natures and possesses both a real divinity and a real humanity. And so the union is real and also at the same time distinct. And distinction, by the way, does not mean that it's separated or divided. Now, uh, when, Cal when uh, Constantinople uh, II closes, you think that it might be the end, but no, as I said, the debate shifts in 680, 681, and it's called by Emperor Constantine IV to settle the issue of, in what sense, Christ is too. And now we get the debate about energies. The debate becomes, how does Christ, the one Christ, possess two wills and two energies, and they're only being one divine subject that's doing these actions. And so there we get the defense of the doctrine of diothelitism uh, and dioenergism, two wills and two energies, uh, not just by St. Maximus, but also by the West. Pope St. Agatho confirms the theological argumentation of St. Maximus as well as the rest of the council, and you get a recondemnation uh, of uh, previous heresies. You get the condemnation of monothelitism. Monothelitism, you get uh, also in the Confession of St. Sophronius, this, the correct interpretation of the duality uh, that's in Christ. Uh, and I'll be listing and showing uh, multiple books that will help those that want to dive deeper into this, uh, into these topics if they want to at the end of this video. But so that's the Sixth Council, and of course St. Maximus is the premier theologian there, as well as others, but Maximus certainly stands out. Uh, and as, as you can imagine, it's the debate is still not settled, right? So there's still more debates to come, and it shifts to liturgy, right? So now we've pretty much settled what the Church, uh, in her universal mind, understands the Trinity and the, the, the Christological statements to mean, what the, the Creed meant, uh, what the consistent teaching of the fathers from the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth centuries all said, now it shifts to worship. And there's a question over, well, how should we worship Christ? Uh, how should we direct our worship to the triune God, uh, given the fact that we have images, right? The church has uh, a pretty well-established liturgical rite and tradition by this time period that's consistent there's minor variations and, and debates, as we saw earlier with like the date of Easter at Nicaea, but for the most part, it's consistent. And here the question becomes, should we have icons and images of Christ? And so Nicaea too is called by Constantine the Sixth and Empress Irene, and it uh, condemns and addresses the heresy of iconoclasm. 
excuse me, iconoclasm, vindicating the theology of St. Theodore the Studite. And eventually you get St. Uh, John Damascus basically uh, laying out this whole iconographic tradition based on the Christological doctrines, the doctrines of the Incarnation. So that's the first seven councils. They all relate to Christ and the Trinity in some direct way. That's the order of theology that Orthodox theology does. It doesn't begin with soteriology like Protestantism. It works soteriology out from, from uh, the prior uh, assumptions and establishment of Trinitarian and Christological doctrines. If you're looking for a couple of books that will deal with each of these subjects, for the first, second, and third councils, I recommend the Pelican set. So you have the first one, which is Emergence of the Catholic Tradition. That covers about the first four or five centuries. And then you get uh, the emergence of the East, Eastern Christendom, which will treat of the Byzantine uh, period of the church. And uh, if you're looking at Ephesus, I would recommend the uh, excellent treatment of uh, John McGuckin, St. Cyril of Alexandria, and the Christological Controversy. Um, if you're looking at the Fifth Council and uh, St. Justinian, in the confirmation of the divine personhood of, of the incarnate Christ. I would look to the person of Christ in the Christology of Emperor Justinian. It also includes the dogmatic sections of the council in an appendix. Um, for the sixth council, I would recommend something actually pretty small, but maybe a little advanced, but it's the little book, St. Maximus the Confessor in the Disputation with Pyrrhus, because this disputation is what settles the council theologically, the argumentation there. For the seventh council, I recommend St. Theodore the Studite's little book on the holy icons, and you'll see him argue from Christology all the iconological conclusions and liturgical conclusions, and then to kind of cap it all off, I would, uh, I would say the St. John of Damascus work that includes his main three pieces of argumentation. So if you would, please uh, hit like and subscribe below and share this video. And uh, I'll have links, by the way, to the longer treatments of many of these subjects in the show description below. If you like this analysis, be sure to click subscribe and give me a thumbs up down below. Also, be sure to check out Jay's analysis uh, and definitely click the bell down below to be sure you get the updates.